Welcome to this fourth and final class in interactive media art at Hackaday U. In this final class, we'll take a look at what we've already learned about planning our interactivity and programming using flowcharts and interactivity matrices, and implement a finite state machine in our code using a switch case statement. This is a very useful construct for really nailing down what your program or project is doing in every mode or state that it's in. It's also easy to adapt for more complex programs with multiple inputs and outputs, such as room scale experiences. And it's easy to edit if you decide the interactivity isn't really working in a given state. We're also going to discuss off-board sensors and how to work with those, so you can explore sensors beyond what's already on the Circuit Playground Express. We'll discuss biosensors and computer vision as well. We'll also discuss places to find inspiration and techniques for integrating sensors into objects and experiences. We'll learn about how to communicate with other programs using a variety of communication protocols and learn about some cool software you might want to use in addition to Arduino. Finally, we'll conclude by examining design and development techniques in project planning singular or room scale experiences, including user testing. We've got a ton to cover this class, so let's get going. A finite state machine, usually abbreviated as FSM, is a computational model that can be used to simulate sequential logic representing and controlling execution flow. A finite state machine can be used to model problems in lots of different fields, including mathematics, artificial intelligence, games, or linguistics. In an FSM, a machine or program can only be in one state at a time. By figuring out what states our machine can be in and what the transitions are from one state to a next, it can help us realize how to program the logic for our installation, interactive artwork, or experience. We've talked a bit already about states and how thinking of our programs as moving through different states can help us with our programming as well as the logic for our interactivity. But how do we program using states? First, let's clarify what we mean by states. You can think of a state as a mode for your program. This will vary depending on what you're building. But let's say we're designing an exercise wearable that plays music based on someone's heart rate. If the heart rate is way up, we want to play something that's at a fast BPM to keep them motivated. If their heart rate is slow, we want to play soothing music. Now, this is a little difficult to do with the Circuit Playground Express. It doesn't have a heart rate reader. But let's just talk about it as a hypothetical situation. What might be the states for our program? Well, we might want to have a warm-up state when the device is first turned on. This will let the user know that the device isn't broken. It just needs a little time to calibrate. During this state, we might play a little jingle while we calibrate our sensors and take our readings. Next, we'll want to do something based on that reading, and maybe we have a couple modes here. This is where we'll want to play our music. We probably want to keep taking sensor readings during this state just to make sure that our music matches the heart rate, but we only want to do this after a reasonable amount of time. Otherwise, the music will keep changing and it might be annoying to the user. If there's a change to our input state, then we want to change our output state. This is very important. We don't want to constantly be re-triggering the same interactivity. Otherwise, the person will hear the same song starting over and over and over again. We only want to change if there's been a change in the heart rate. We haven't done this yet, and I'll show you how to do this shortly. Finally, we want to have some timeout function or a way of ending our program. Let's say that there's a power down button. Maybe just like with our power on state, we want to play a little jingle while it's powering down. Maybe this happens for about five seconds. What would this look like in a flowchart? Here we can see we've executed a flowchart that walks us through our states. We write in our transitions between states where the lines go from one state to the next. We have a state for startup, a state for play mode, and a state for power down. In startup, we take a reading from our sensor. We also play our startup sound. After five seconds, we enter into play mode and again take a reading from our sensor at regular intervals while also outputting different music if the sensor data has changed. We only do this if we're in state two, which is the state for play mode. We have two options for this mode, fast or slow, depending on the heart rate sensor. Finally, we have a power down state that gets executed playing the power down sound when the power button is pressed and this continues for five seconds. Using this flowchart, it would be pretty easy to create the logic for our program. But considering we don't have a heart rate sensor, 
How about we have a look at how a different but similar program might work using the Circuit Playground Express? From your course files, open the sketch for State Machine. Let's go back to our earlier example of a light sensor responsive lamp that changes colors based on the light sensor data. Let's create a sketch where we'll do something different depending on whether it's a sunny day, cloudy day, or nighttime. If you open the sketch for State Machine, you'll see an example of this. We start our sketch with a new data type. On line 10, we see Enum State, Night Overcast Sunny. An enumerated type, or Enum for short, is a data type consisting of a set of named values called elements. The enumerator names are usually identifiers that behave as constants. Each enumerator has a name that's easy for a human to read and identify, but under the hood it's interchangeable with a number. For example, in enum state night overcast sunny, night is 0, overcast is 1, and sunny would be 2. In this way, an enumerator is a useful way to address your states by numbers or by name. Using enums increases the level of abstraction and lets the programmer think about what the values mean rather than worrying about how they're stored and accessed. You'll see this more and it'll make sense as we go through the sketch. Next we have a variable to keep track of our state and our last state. This is going to be useful because as I mentioned in our earlier example, we want to switch state only when there's been a change. If we keep switching the state, we'll re-trigger our interactivity. So if our interactivity is something like a song, we might re-trigger the song from the beginning each time if we're not checking to see if our state has changed. Instead, we only want to trigger our state change if it's been changed. We'll have a look at that later on in the sketch to see how that works. To begin with, we want to have an int state, and we want to set it different to something than our last state. Otherwise, our first check won't work and our code won't run. Then we have code for our timer. And our timer is set to update every thousand milliseconds. So this is going to be a timer for our entire loop, meaning how often should we check. So in this case, we're going to check our sensor every a thousand milliseconds. And then we also have an unsigned long to hold our timing millis. Again, you always have to have an unsigned long for millis values, otherwise you might overflow the variable. These two lines should look very familiar. We're storing a value for our low light and for our bright light, and these are our thresholds for both low light and bright light. You can adjust these, of course, to whatever is low light for you, meaning whatever would be nighttime or darkness. And also you can adjust the bright light to be whatever might be a sunny day. Nothing unusual in our setup except that we're including a three second delay, a warm up delay. I often like to do this, especially when I'm using sensitive sensors, because a lot can happen when your microcontroller is starting up and you don't want all that noise. So it's an easy way to factor out that noise and just start once everything is settled down. Then in our loop, we see right off the bat, we're starting with our timer and we're checking to see if the millis is greater than our timing millis. At the end of our sketch, we'll update timing millis to be millis plus our event update timer so that we can keep track of the time. So every second, it will trigger everything within that loop. Then we see that we're storing our light sensor data as int sensor val. You can switch this out for whatever sensor you want to try with this sketch. Then we have our if else if else statement where we check our sensor value. And we're looking to see if our sensor value is lower than or equal to low light, which again, we've set up here. And if it is, then we want to set the state to night. So we've decided that it will be night if the sensor value is lower than our low light or equal to our low light value, which makes sense. In the else if statement, it says if the sensor value is greater than low light, and if it's less than bright light, meaning if it's about average light, then we're gonna say that it's overcast. You might have more than one mode in between night and sunny, but for the sake of this demonstration, we just have one. Then we have another else if statement to say if the sensor value is greater than or equal to bright light, then we're gonna set the state to sunny. Finally, we have an else statement to print if the sensor's out of range. Hypothetically, this should never run, 
but it's always good to have a just-in-case state in case your sensor does something really weird. Next we have our switch case statement. And in this case, we're actually using it with a state. So the first thing we do is we check to see if the state has changed, meaning is the state not the same as the last state? Again, this is why it's important that we start out with different state values in the beginning. Then if our state is not equal to our last state, we'll want to switch the case. So if our case is night, meaning if our sensor value is less than and equal to low light, right now we're just going to print night. But you can set this to be whatever you like. It could be a fast LED animation, it could be playing a tune, completely up to you. Similarly, we have a case for overcast and a case for sunny. We could just as easily, because these are enumerators, say zero, one, and two. And these would be the same thing as what we have up here, night, overcast, and sunny, because they're in order for zero, one, and two. But it's a little hard to read this and figure out what it is, especially if we take out the serial print line statement. So let's not do that. We also have a default case, which again should never happen, but again, it's good practice to keep it in. As a reminder, switch case statements always end with a break. To learn more about switch case statements, you can see the Arduino reference. At the very end of all of this, we're setting our last state variable to be our state. And that basically holds the state. So we know what the last state was, so that when we start our loop over again, and we do our comparison, then we know that we are comparing correctly the last state to our state. And if it hasn't changed, for example, if it continues to be a sunny day, we don't execute anything. Again, this is really important because if we didn't have a serial print line statement in here and instead had something that really requires an action that isn't interrupted, like starting a song, we wouldn't want to start the song over and over again. We would just want it to play once and continue to play until the state has changed. So this allows us to do that, this combination of checking if the state has changed and then updating the state at the end. And then the last thing we do again is to update our timer. So give this a try and as a challenge, try to put different things inside of the switch case statement and try to use some different sensors. So can you do the same thing with the sound sensor, but when it's a loud sound, have it have a very bright lighting pattern play? Or if it's a quiet sound, have it play a very muted breathing pattern? Give it a try and play around with this a bit, especially the timers and also the different states. Like I said before, you can of course add more states, just add whatever makes sense and make sure in your if else statement that you're really checking to make sure that you're not overlapping. So for example, if I had set this to, if I had two cases where it could be equal to low light, this will be confusing. And so both of these will execute. And so make sure that you're, you're not having overlapping if else statements or overlapping thresholds. So if I upload this and I put my hand over the sensor, I can see that it changes to night, and it only prints night once because it's only changed state once. But if I take my hand off, then I see that it does a sensor reading and reads sunny. Again, it's not printing sunny, sunny, sunny over and over again because it's only printing it when it's changed its state. If I put my hand over again, we see night. So you can see how useful this is in just getting one thing to execute and then continue to execute again and again and again until something's different. And then it switches to the next state and does the next kind of interactivity. Open the sketch for calibration. When you have an installation that's running for a long time, your sensor value and threshold might change a bit. How can you adjust for this without having to be present and manually adjust the threshold every time? Well, there's a way of auto calibrating your sensor and it's shown in the sketch for calibration. This can be used for any sensor, but for this case, we're using it for capacitive touch values. In the sketch, you'll see different options for using it with different sensors on the Circuit Playground Express. 
We start by declaring sensor pin as A1. Now we have our integer to holder sensor value, and we have an integer for sensor min and sensor max. This is 0 to 1023, which is the minimum and maximum for that sensor. It might change a little bit based on your sensor, but these are likely the values that you'll have. Then we have a threshold value that we've set to 200, and you might think, how is this different than the threshold sketch? Well, this value actually is between 0 and 255 and reflects a mapped value of our sensor threshold. We'll show you that in a second. Then we have a debounce of 100. Again, delays are not ideal, but sometimes if you have a very simple sketch, say a sketch that's only taking sensor data, then it's okay to have a delay or a debounce rate. This is to keep the sensor from creating too much noise and getting readings that aren't correct. This will vary depending on what sensor you have and what kind of noise you have with your sensor, but sometimes this is the best way. You can also replace this with a timer if you prefer. In setup, we have a warm-up delay of 3000. This is to wait until the microcontroller has fully started up. Then we have something a bit unusual, which is a while loop within our setup. And you might wonder, why is a while loop in our setup? We usually put while loops and other loops and other kinds of interactivity in our loop function. Well, if you remember from the beginning, anything that's in setup will only run one time. We only want to calibrate our sensor within the first five seconds of our sketch. And so we put it in setup, and it only runs once. We can see that the while loop says while millis is less than 5,000, meaning while the time that's elapsed since we ran our sketch is less than 5,000 milliseconds, or five seconds, do the following. And the following is our calibration loop. Here we set the sensor value to read the cap sensor pin. In the next section, we have an if statement. If the sensor value is greater than our sensor max, then the sensor max is our sensor value. So we're seeing if our sensor value has gone beyond what we're allowing as our sensor maximum. If so, we reset sensor max. We're doing the same for the minimum value in the next if statement. We're checking to see if the sensor value has somehow gone below zero. If it has, then we're setting our sensor minimum to the new lowest value which is the value that our sensor value is reading. In our loop, we're again reading the sensor value, and we put it in loop so that we can read it each time as the first thing we do in our loop. Then we're printing the raw value and the sensor value that we're getting in. This is to illustrate how this sketch is working. You don't necessarily need to keep this in. Then we're mapping the sensor value to the range that's between our minimum and maximum. So if you remember, our minimum is 0 and our sensor max is 1023. So what we're saying is take 0 and map it to 0, and take 1023 and map it to 255. That will give us a range of between 0 and 255. Then we're showing what our mapped value is. Next we're using a constrain. So this is saying that if the sensor value is outside somehow the range of 0 to 255, then constrain it. This is to make sure that the sensor value is a correct reading. Then we're printing that value. Finally, we're doing our interactivity. So if the sensor value is greater than our threshold, we'll play a tone. We also have an else loop in here, but we don't have anything that we're doing in this else loop. You can put something in if you want to. Finally, we conclude with a debounce. Give this sketch a try and see how it works. You'll notice that the 0 to 255 is now the value that you'll get instead of 0 to 1023, and this will be consistent for nearly every sensor. So every sensor you have will have a value between 0 and 255. You can see how this would be very useful in determining what a default threshold might be. So for example, if you're having a sensor that creeps increasingly towards 255, you could set your threshold higher. Or if you wanted to have a less sensitive sensor, you can set it somewhere in the middle of 0 and 255, say 150 or so. If I open up Serial Monitor, I can see the raw value, the mapped value, and the constrained value. When I press the pin, I hear a tone play. Open the sketch for running average. 
In this sketch, we'll learn how to calculate a running average and then self-calibrate for our cap touch pins. The basic principle of a running average is create an array of measurements, a variable to keep track of which one you're currently on, and a variable to hold your average. Then every time you take a measurement, you'll put your new measurement in the current element of the array, and you'll increase the position by one, or reset it to zero if you're at the end of the array. Then you'll divide the sum of all the measurements, here accomplished by continuously subtracting the old reading and then adding the new one, by the total number of measurements in the array. You can see this at work in the take reading function. Here we have a save index of zero. Next, we're gonna subtract the last reading as indicated by total equals total minus readings read index. Then we're going to read from the sensor using circuit playground read cap cap pin. Then we save our index so we can return the value. Then we add the reading to the total. And then we go to the next position in the array. If we're at the end of the array, we go back to zero. On line 61 is where we actually calculate the average. And then we return it. Doing this gives you an average of the last n values read by the sensor, one that continually updates as new values are read. This trick is very useful for smoothing data. If you have a sensor that is susceptible to noise or tends to spike between values, it's also good for self calibrating systems that depend on a threshold, which can change like capacitive touch. Upload the sketch and give it a try. Try touching pad A1 and watching the serial monitor for change. You can watch the running average rise and drop as you touch the pad. In serial monitor, I can see the capacitive touch reading and the running average as they come in. If I touch the sensor, I see touched, and I also see that the capacitive touch reading and the average change. Once you've exhausted the possibilities of the onboard sensors of the Circuit Playground Express, the fun is just beginning. You can control any number of input-output devices using the digital and analog pins on the Circuit Playground Express. You can even control sensors, which use some relatively advanced protocols, like Serial and I2C. One thing to note when using external sensors is the logic level of the sensor. 3.3 volts and 5 volts are two very common control voltages that sensors are built to run on. The GPIO pins on the Circuit Playground Express run on 3.3 volts, like most teensies while the GPIO pins on an Arduino Uno or a Mega run on 5 volts. While most output devices built for 5 volts will work okay at a 3.3 volt logic level, like our NeoPixels, some input sensors are built for a 5 volt logic level and won't work at 3.3 volts. If you run into this problem, an easy way to address it is to add a logic level shifter. This is about three bucks and is a board that converts 3.3 volts logic to 5 volts logic, or vice versa. I like to use this one from SparkFun. At this point, you might be asking, where do I find sensors and how do I use them? I always recommend starting at Adafruit and SparkFun. Both sites are aimed at makers and artists, so they sell tons of sensors which work with the Arduino IDE and come with libraries or example code that you can download and use. They also provide plenty of step-by-step -step tutorials for many of their sensors and output devices. Here you'll find everything from distance and movement sensors to tiny cameras and LCD screens that you can drive with your circuit playground. I've also found a ton of useful stuff, especially servos and other motors, LiDAR scanners and rangefinders, and other things one might want to put in a mobile robot on DF Robot. Digikey and Mauser are more advanced sources for sensors, mostly because it can be hard to search through tens of thousands of items they have in stock, but braving the onslaught can be worth it. In particular, they can be a great place to pick up a sensor or device if it's out of stock at Adafruit or SparkFun. Digikey carries a lot of brands. 
Both are also great places to pick up general electronic supplies like wire, protoboards, hand tools, soldering supplies, thermal tape, and more. Okay, so now you know where to find sensors, but you might not know what you'd like to get. So here's a quick overview of some sensors I have known and loved. First of all is the potentiometer. A rotary potentiometer is essentially a knob, or at least the inside of a knob. The ones that you buy for use as sensors typically let you add your own knob cap to them. There are hundreds and hundreds of different kinds, but each lets you measure voltage across an analog pin, which then changes as you turn the knob. This can be great for controlling things like volume or the intensity of your algorithm's parameters. If you get a contactless potentiometer, you'll spend way more money, but people who use it will be unable to turn it too far and rip the wires out. This can be great for permanent installations. I like arcade buttons for their familiarity, longevity, and ease of installation and wiring. Adafruit has some that even come with controllable LEDs. Buttons are incredibly easy to read. The pin connected to them is either digital high or digital low, depending on whether the button is pressed. You can experiment with this using the onboard buttons of the Circuit Playground, but if you want a fancier button, consider going off-board. A Hall effect sensor detects magnetism. Along with a small, rare earth magnet glued to the object you wish to detect, it's an astonishingly affordable way to detect whether things are in their resting position or have been moved. For instance, it's one of my go-to sensors when I need to check whether a cabinet or drawer has been opened or closed, or whether a special object, which slots in place, has been moved. The one I like to use is a DI AH9250, which you can find on DigiKey. Ultrasonic sensors detect distance, and thus can also work as motion or person detectors. I've found that they often work better than the small PIR sensors you see in a lot of Arduino motion detection applications. This one is cool due to the long length of its cord, almost 8 feet, combined with a waterproof sensor probe you can hide anywhere. Check out DF Robot for this product. Weight sensors can be really useful for triggering doors to open when someone is standing on a surface or effects need to change based on how many people are in a room. Weight sensors are usually referred to as load cells and are rated for different weights, so choose them accordingly. Pressure sensors usually come in the form of FSRs, force sensitive resistors. They are great for inserting into objects to see when they've been pushed. They can be pretty fragile though, so make sure you install them securely and beware that they may need ongoing maintenance. I want to talk a little about biosensors because people are always so interested in using them in their art. I want to encourage you to do that, but I will say that biosensors are very noisy. You will likely have to do a lot of manipulation of the data in order to control things using them, unless you're using a sensor that comes with a library that handles the smoothing for you. One sensor I really enjoy is the galvanic skin response sensor. This measures your electrodermal activity, meaning the electrical conductivity of your skin, sweat and all. To wear this sensor, the subject puts their index and middle finger into the fabric loops, where there are two dry electrodes. This sensor is a useful gauge for stimulation and has been used for determining excitement, stress, pain, and more. One thing I'd like to point out with this sensor is that an excited state could be read either as caused by something good or bad. The sensor will read both the same way depending on the person, so keep that in mind. An ECG or electrocardiogram sensor, also known as a heart rate sensor, works by connecting the sensor to three different test leads. These leads have electrodes at the end which connect to the body in the position shown. The electrodes are usually capped with adhesive pads that are dipped in a gel which improves the conductivity. You can find a tutorial for this here. A less invasive and easier to install heart rate sensor is a pulse sensor that uses photoplasmography. These sensors work by shining a small LED at the skin and then using a light detector to detect minute changes in blood volume due to fluctuations in blood flow. Similar to ECG, EEG sensors work by connecting various leads that end in electrodes to specific locations on the head to measure brain activity. 
EEG is measured in different channels of activity, and actually understanding what these channels means, either in isolation or in combination, is an extremely challenging task, even for medical experts. If your goal is simply to create artwork with EEG, however, there are a number of companies that create limited channel EEG headsets. Some companies include software specifically for developers, and some you have to pay extra to gain development access. EEG sensors are extremely noisy, and it can be difficult to make any purposeful, meaningful work using them, unless you've done a lot of manipulation of the data or chosen your channels very carefully. Muscle movement will add noise, too, so in order to use this sensor, your subject should be still and relaxed. Computer vision can be an extremely useful way to trigger interactivity. Using libraries like OpenCV and a camera, you can detect movement, the number of people in a room, how many people are smiling, what color shirt everyone's wearing, specific gestures, even hand gestures, and so on. Computer vision can be used for proximity even without a depth or skeletal camera by examining the distance between faces, the top of blobs, and the ratio of the face to determine distance from the camera. For an easier way to do this, you might try purchasing a Kinect, OpenMV, or RealSense camera, which also come with software to help you develop your program. Here are two interesting wearable projects that use computer vision for facial recognition. The left is by Anuquiprect and is a wearable featuring a set of tentacles that wiggle depending on if they detect a face. The wearable on the left, Opal, is by Benaz Farahi and features a selection of spikes that, like the fur of a cat, respond to facial expression, either laying flat or standing on end. Going beyond simple one-pin sensors, I2C is a two-wire protocol for communicating with simple sensors and devices. You need two pins to control I2C, usually referred to as SCL and SDA. If you look closely at the pinout map, you'll see that SCL on the Circuit Playground Express is pin A4, slash 48, and SDA is pin A5, slash 47. Knowing this, you can control just about any sensor or device that speaks I2C. If you're wondering if your sensor speaks I2C, it should say it on its spec sheet. You can learn more about I2C here, including some code examples. One of my favorite I2C devices is the VL53L0X Time of Flight Distance Sensor. This sensor measures distances between the sensor and any object or person within 30 millimeters and 1,000 millimeters, or about 3 feet. It's perfect for person detection directly in front of an object, like, for instance, triggering a video or interactivity when someone approaches your artwork. And it can also be used to measure distance if you need to measure how far away things are in a linear fashion. However, its field of detection is very narrow, so it only measures things directly in front of it. If you need to monitor a small area rather than a narrow, single location, the ultrasonic sensors might be a better choice. What's your favorite sensor? Let us know in the Discord or in our office hours. Most sensors will come with hookup guides written by the manufacturer. If you don't have one, you can look up the name of your sensor plus hookup guide, and you'll usually find quite a few options. Once you have that open, it should show you how to hook up your sensor to your controller. Match this with your wires. You can either use alligator clips or alligator clips with male or female ends to jumper cables. Here I've hooked up the circuit playground to V out, ground, and SDA SCL as shown. Many sensors also come with libraries that'll give you code examples that are ready to use. See if your library is already in Arduino library options, you can go to Tools, Manage Libraries, and then search for your sensor. Here I see that the first option that comes up is the Adafruit VL6180X sensor by Adafruit. Since I did get this sensor from Adafruit, I'm going to install that one. But you can also see that there's a few other options. If you don't get one library to work, it's worth trying the other options. I'm going to select the most current version to install and then click Install. 
Once it's done, I should be able to use the example code. If you can't find your sensor in the Arduino libraries, you might have to manually download and install it. A good place to find libraries is, of course, on GitHub. You can do a quick search for your sensor. Then what you want to do is you want to grab all of the code as a zip file. So you'll go to code and then download zip. To install your new library, you can go to sketch, include library, add a zip library. Then you want to navigate to where your library is. Mine's on my desktop. This will add your library to your sketch. If you've installed the library, we should be able to open it in example sketches. In Arduino, go to examples, and then go down to where you see the name of the sensor. Here we have two examples, one which is the normal example and one which seems to be used with an OLED display. Since we don't have an OLED display, let's use the first example. This should give us some code that's ready to use. We should be able to upload it and see the values for the sensors. However, sometimes library sketches give us a lot of extra information. So it's worth going through and weeding out things you don't need. In this sketch, there's a lot of if else ifs, and these are related to the sensor not working. So this controls an error message if the sensor is having trouble. In practice, once you have your sensor working, you can take all this out unless you want to keep it in, but it's not required. The real meat of the sketch is in our loop function. Because the VL6180X also has an onboard light sensor, this sketch also prints that value out. This is similar to the light sensor that's already on board the Circuit Playground Express. So here we're setting the value lux to the reading of that sensor, and then we're printing it out. Again, if you only want to use the proximity for the sensor, you can take that out. Here we see that we're declaring our range to be the reading of the range. Read range is a function of this library. Then we're also setting the status to be the read range status. This is what will give us our error message. Again, you don't need this if you're sure that your sensor is working. So if I were going to trim this down to just give me the proximity, I would take all of this out. I might also take out the delay if I wanted to use a timer. I'm also going to take out the light reading. And now we just have a range, but we probably want to print out what that is. So let's do a serial print line statement. The code in setup we can leave as is. All it's doing is saying if it can find the sensor or not. We can take it out if we want to, but let's just leave it in in this case. You'll also see as our parameter for serial.begin that we're beginning at a baud rate of 115,200. Baud rates are different for different sensors. Some are faster and some are slower. You just want to make sure that it matches whatever you're using in serial monitor so that you're reading the sensor correctly. In this demo from Adafruit, you can see the sensor working with the OLED display. This sensor is one of my favorites for triggering proximity at a close range. It also works with a piece of small acrylic in front of it, which is unusual for time-of-flight sensors. One of my favorite programs for triggering interactivity, especially video, is Touch Designer. There's a non-commercial free version you can download from the derivative website that will allow you to try it out and there are lots of wonderful tutorials online. Touch Designer works really well for processing video feedback and doing simple projection mapping using sensor data. Under the hood, Touch Designer is written in Python, and you can actually write Python scripts within Touch Designer, but you also don't need to know Python in order to use it, as it has a node-based interface. For audio processing, I really recommend Max MSP. MaxMSP is not free, but Cycling74, the company which produces it, offers a free trial as well as discounted licenses for students. The back end of MaxMSP is C, but again you don't need to know how to use it in order to use the program. MaxMSP also has a video processing component Jitter, and has a legacy community of followers and developers. Processing is an excellent option if you're interested in producing simple GUIs 
or geometry based on sensor input. Processing is written in JavaScript, which you do have to know at least a little in order to use. That said, processing has some of the best getting started tutorials I've ever seen, and because it was designed to be used for creative coding, and its web-focused sister P5.js is also designed to be used for creative purposes, they're both extremely well documented with creative programming tutorials. The simplest and easiest to set up form of communication is serial communication. That's what we've been using this entire class to communicate between your computer and the board. Serial communication uses the serial bus to communicate one bit at a time. You don't need anything aside from the micro USB cable you've already been using. All you have to do is make sure you select a serial object in the corresponding program and have it connected to the correct port for your controller. As an example of this, Touch Designer has a serial DAT and a serial CHOP, which can easily be set up to grab data from your controller, simply by aiming the port parameter at the port for your controller. MaxMSP also has a serial object that's similarly quite easy to configure as shown. But what if you don't want to have wires between your microcontroller and the computer? What can you do? One option is Bluetooth. Bluetooth is a wireless form of communication that you might have used on your cell phone, headphones, or another device. While I tend to avoid Bluetooth because it can be fussy and connectivity can waver, it's an okay choice for static objects. Adafruit actually makes a version of Circuit Playground Express that is specifically designed to work with Bluetooth. Bluetooth will allow you to communicate with any device that has Bluetooth connectivity, such as mobile phones, other controllers that also have Bluetooth enabled, and computers. But what about Wi-Fi? Well, in order to connect your Circuit Playground Express to Wi-Fi, you'll need either an ESP8266 or an ESP32 breakout to use as your wireless modem. Once connected, this will enable you to do all sorts of IoT or Internet of Things projects and connect to other wireless devices like your phone and computer. Want to change your fast LED lighting pattern based on how many people are tweeting about comets? Well, now you can. Adafruit has a guide to using the ESP32 if you'd like to give it a try. For the same reason I avoid Bluetooth in permanent installations, I also avoid using Wi-Fi. While less physically messy than a wired connection, Wi-Fi can be a pain to maintain. If it drops out, you'll need a way of resetting it, and you'll need to monitor it to make sure it always stays connected. So what's a good, reliable connection for a permanent installation? Say, one that you want to have running for years and years. Well, I'd recommend a wired connection. Unfortunately, to get this to work, you'll need an Ethernet shield, like the WizNet W5500 for Arduino Uno, or the Wiz812 Ethernet module for Teensy. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to locate a compatible Ethernet shield for the Circuit Playground Express, but hopefully in the future, someone will make that happen. I'll try to keep you all updated on the Hackaday page. Once you have your controller set up to use Ethernet with a shield, there are a few options for communication that have been tested and proven. Which one you select will depend a bit on your preference and a bit on the needs of the project. My favorite and the one I've used the most during my career is OSC. OSC stands for Open Sound Control, and despite the name, it's not just for controlling sounds. It's a great way to control an entire show, or speak between devices. To use OSC, you'll usually install an OSC library, which will give you instructions on how to format your OSC messages. These messages allow you to communicate between programs. Messages could be the equivalent of, Hey Touch Designer, my light sensor is reading that it's bright. Turn all the lights in the venue to blue. Or, Hey Maximus P, someone touched my capacitive touch sensor. Trigger the amazing 8-channel spatial audio experience. Of course, messages aren't formatted like sentences, but essentially this is the sort of information you'll be communicating between programs. Another very reliable form of communication is TCP IP, which stand for Transmission Control Protocol and Internet Protocol, respectively. You probably recognize that last one and can figure out what this does. The first part, TCP, is responsible for chopping up messages into packets of information. Then IP is used to address and route each package. UDP stands for User Data Protocol, and it's similar, but it doesn't establish a connection with the host prior to sending the data. It just sends it. TCP IP, on the other hand, really care if the message is received, 
so they establish that connection. You could compare this to a message you send with the post office that has a receipt confirmation service. UDP would be the one without this service. If no one gets the message, it just disappears and you never know. So why would you ever want to use UDP? Well, because it's fast. I once had an installation where I had to trigger a ton of lights based on sensor data from a couple very fast sensors, and I found that OSC just wasn't keeping up. I ended up having to use UDP, which was much faster, and because I didn't really need that receipt of confirmation, it was a good choice. A few students have asked me now about where I get my inspiration and how I organize my ideas. Usually what I'll do is I'll start with a mood board, and I tend to use Pinterest for this. And what I'll do is I'll either collect images that I find elsewhere, or I'll specifically search for images that are within the database, and find things like similar textures or colors or materials that I'm interested in working with. And these can range from biological creatures to materials that are 3D printed to sculptures. It's also a nice way of exploring what's already been done and how I might do things differently. Based on aspects of these images, I might develop my own sketches or concept art. I'm also inspired by new materials, including sensors, actuators, and computer vision technologies. In this video, you can see artist and researcher Ji Chi manipulating origami using a material called shape and memory alloy. Shape memory alloy is a material which you can train to be a specific shape. You can then manipulate it, and when you apply heat, it will return to that shape. Here we see it used as an actuator for controlling the origami. Often before I make a larger installation, I'll do a smaller version like this just to do a test of motion and to see how the electronics are working. I might do a stress test to see how durable they are, or have different people try them out to see what the user experience might be like for different people. Inert materials like fabrics and 3D printing resins and filaments are also inspiring for me. Here's an elastic resin from Formlabs which I can imagine all kinds of uses for, from LED diffusion to flexible wearables. I'll usually begin with a small sample of whatever material I'm using, like this one, and just see what I can do with it in order to get ideas about the limitations and possibilities for that material. I might try using different lighting effects also to see how it might be used as a diffuser. To learn new techniques, I tend to explore blogs and forums. Hackaday.io has tons of projects that often include code samples and lists of materials so you can try projects out yourself. You can find projects by what's most recent or what's popular, or if you have a particular genre of project in mind, you can check out the main project page where you'll find everything from brain hacking to hacker art. Hackster.io is a maker dedicated site loaded with videos, workshops, interviews with makers, and project tutorials, as well as some excellent articles on new projects like this adorable tiny robot by maker Rung Zhang Li. Similarly, the Arduino Project Hub is loaded with example projects and tutorials that range from easy to Wow, I certainly cannot make that, but I'm very glad you did. The makers of Teensy, PJRC, also host a blog that keeps the community in the know of new Teensy-powered projects. I recommend checking this out, even if you haven't used the Teensy. The Instructables website isn't limited to electronics or engineering projects, but it's an amazing resource for tutorials of all kinds, from how to etch PCBs with pickle juice to how to make robotic fish for your futuristic koi pond. When I'm designing a project, I'll tend to come back to the same set of questions which will help me along. These questions might vary a little on the project and its intent, especially if it's an artwork or a product, but below is a set of questions that seems to come up for me again and again. The first is, what emotions do I wish to evoke? And the second, closely related, is how will I evoke those emotions? Your mind might jump to considering what outputs, like sound and lighting, you're going to use to create an environment but it's equally important to consider what actions you're asking the viewer or visitor to do and what mindset or emotional state that might put them in. For example, if your output is sound and the trigger for your interactivity is to sit on the floor, the visitor will probably be in a different state than if your trigger is to arm wrestle a robot. The next question is, what is the expected interactivity and have I made that clear? I think as designers, it's easy to automatically respond yes to this question. But keep in mind, we have our biases. 
the big one being that we know how our program works. We've probably been thinking about it intensely for days, weeks, months, years. User testing will help us figure this out further down the line, but even as we're still designing and developing, we want to consider what other kinds of interactions are possible. From everything that is possible, what kinds of interactions do we want to encourage and which do we want to discourage? And how can we do that? If you have multiple inputs in a desired sequence for your interactivity, this can be a really tricky question. Sometimes positioning and the size of inputs can really guide the viewer. You can also use light and sound as feedback to reward or discourage specific choices. The next question investigates the length of the experience, and that might seem kind of trivial, but again, understanding timing and sequence is essential to planning your interactivity. You might plan a 20-minute interactive video sequence, but how long do you think someone will reasonably interact with that experience, especially if it's in a crowd? If it's an object, is there a sequence to that interactivity? Is it okay if the viewer doesn't complete that sequence? Does the object have a reset mode if it's not interacted with over a certain period of time? And how about variety of experience? Will the viewer experience different things each time to reward repeat experiences? Or do you want to keep the experience the same because it's meaningful that way? If your experience is long, you might want to add events along the way to encourage the viewer to continue to interact. It's important to keep accessibility in mind when designing artworks as well as experiences. How will viewers or users of different abilities interact with your work? Does the interactivity hinge on a particular ability, sight, sound, being able to reach or pull or manipulate something? If so, is there a way for you to create redundant feedback in another form, such as haptic feedback or light, in addition to sound content? Safety is also of great concern, especially with electronic works. The last thing you want is for your work to hurt someone. Make sure your cables are neatly managed and aren't trip hazards. Wires should be tucked away where they can't be yanked. They should be secured. Power supplies should be completely out of reach of the public and in ventilated compartments. Your work should be safe for those who will handle it delicately as well as for two-year-olds who might enjoy a round of yank out all the cables. It's also important to have a plan for maintenance. We've talked a bit about how sensors might need ongoing observation and some ways to get around this. But stuff can happen, especially over the course of a long exhibition or a permanent installation, and especially if you have embedded sensors in your work, like a sculpture or other hands-on experience where they're likely to get jostled. If you're creating an artwork, you'll want to consider if there's a way to test your electronics while they're still embedded, rather than having to take them out. This could be something like putting your LEDs on full white so it's easy to see if any have burnt out, or turning your sound to play a demo or testing song. You'll also want to make sure that anything that might need to be replaced is easy to swap out. For LEDs, I recommend using connectors and including some extra ready-to-be-attached strands. I also always include extra batteries or an extra power supply. Sound equipment can be a little trickier, but I find again using connectors and simple diagrams goes a long way. Before anything goes live, and ongoingly during the prototyping stage, I like to do a few kinds of testing with my colleagues who are all experts in their own field, and members of the public, especially people who I don't know. When designing something, it's easy to get in your own head and forget that not everyone will know that they should, say, touch the button at this time in the lighting sequence, or know to press their hand against a particular sculpture. While having Easter eggs, or hidden forms of interactivity intended for die-hard fans, can be really fun, you want to make sure that your top-level interactivity is always intuitive, or else all your hard work may never be fully experienced. As much as you plan to make your interactivity apparent using the questions from the last section, you won't really know if it's intuitive until you test it. I like to do live testing with as large a group as possible that's still maintainable for me. For commercial work, this sometimes means soft openings where we gather feedback, or testing days where we encourage colleagues and visitors to come by and interact with the work, then leave notes. Who should your test group be? For products and company-sponsored work, I prefer this group to include a sizable group from our target audience, and I also like to include a group of subjects of various ages, body types, abilities, etc. to make sure my work is inclusive and accessible. If you can get an accessibility consultant to look over your work at different stages, that is ideal, as they are trained to recognize in what might be an issue for certain users. The specific questions I asked during testing might vary, and the methods I deployed to collect responses, which might include questionnaires, 
in-person interviews, voting for option A or option B, for example, might also change depending on the project. But here's an overview of what I tend to look out for. How did people interact with the work and was it what I expected? How did the experience work for people of all ages, body type, ability, etc.? How long did people interact with the work? Was the interactivity clear? Were there any situations in which the interactivity didn't function? Did participants think the experience was too long or too short? Did the experience work for one person, two, many people? Was the piece successful in being interesting, evoking emotions, and so on? Were there any accessibility concerns that need to be addressed? Does anything need to be adjusted to make it more apparent? When you're scaling upwards from a singular artwork or an exhibition to a room scale exhibition, there are some additional questions you might ask before and during the testing stage, in addition to some of those we asked for a singular work. Here's a few I tend to ask myself and the considerations that go into them. The first is, how would I describe the feel of this room? When we start to add in more elements and we start to go into a large scale exhibition, we run the risk of creating an overwhelming or cacophonous experience. And I don't just mean sound. I've seen beautiful lighting experiences turn to mud because the lighting in one section clashes with another, creating a really unsatisfactory experience. It's important to consider how the various elements are working together to create a harmony of a feeling. You might also consider how someone might feel in different places of the room and what the audience's journey is or could be. Next I ask, how does it connect to previous experiences or artworks in the exhibit? This question also addresses that idea of the audience's journey. In an immersive environment, especially, the goal is to keep the audience immersed within a world. You don't want anything that will take them out of that world. So it's important to consider the narrative underlying your experience. What fits and what doesn't fit? Is this a world in which nothing man-made exists? If so, you're going to need to do extra work to make sure human technologies like speakers and wires aren't visible. You might also consider the journey throughout the space as a learning process. With immersive experiences, we train the audience to interact with the work. Most audiences are still used to standing in front of an artwork at a distance. They've learned that they can't touch an artwork and they can't get close to it. So it might require some encouragement to get them to interact. In your exhibit, they'll learn that if they do X, it will result in something. You'll want to consider what that X is, what the audience has learned, and see if you can use that knowledge and that training to your advantage in order to make your interactivity apparent, while also making sure they won't view your artwork as broken or not functioning if they don't receive a reward for that interaction. The next question is, how does each element add to the story of the complete experience? It can be tempting to include many interactions or objects, but this usually unnecessarily complicates things. In figuring this out, what really needs to be in the room for the work to succeed, it's important to ask why each element is there. What is it doing to further the experience? If the answer is nothing, then cut it. Unless, of course, your experience is Meow Wolf-style maximalism, then more is more. The next question I ask is about the crowd. Who is the crowd going to be? And what is the crowd size? This is really important to consider. In an ideal world, we have one visitor who goes on a journey, spending the time to carefully explore each object. But in reality, this is rarely the case. You want to consider realistically, based on where your room will be and who will be attending the event or venue, what kind of crowd you can expect, what the crowd flow might look like, and how you can accommodate a crowd. A few tips here. I still really love creating intimate one-on-one -on -one experiences where it's really just made for one person, but you can consider how an experience for one person might turn into an experience for those around them. Say you have a sculpture that controls sound and lighting. Could you also rig it to control all the sound and lighting in the room? That way the entire crowd gets to experience it. They might not know that that interactivity is on account of the sculpture, but they'll realize it when they get a chance to interact with it and have an aha moment. You could also have multiple sculptures that mix sound and lighting. Another way to deal with crowds is to detect them and accommodate them. I usually do this by having a crowd mode where perhaps the interactivity is more multiplayer. 
I might also include debouncing options that consider crowds, like people who keep repeatedly tapping on a controller. The next question I ask is, are there any elements which distract from the feeling of the room? Again, more isn't always more, so make sure that everything you've included in the room is harmonious for the feel, aesthetic, and experience you're hoping for. Is this experience over or underwhelming? The answer here is definitely going to vary per person, so this is an important question to ask during testing. You should also ask what specifically was under or overwhelming. In the case of underwhelming experiences, it's often the case that your big interactivity payoff was too difficult to get to, or that it wasn't as big as you thought. Shortening the experience or making it easier might help. In the case of overwhelming, it's usually that the interactivity isn't clear, or there's an unnecessary amount of output happening for each state. Try going back to a flowchart and see if you can't simplify your interactivity. Will people have different experiences depending on where they stand and what they do? Are all of those experiences satisfying in their own way? This goes back to thinking about crowds and different groups of visitors. I like to have both quiet experiences for folks who need a little rest, as well as intense experiences. I feel like the former is often overlooked in immersive environments, but immersive environments don't have to be overwhelming. Have I successfully directed the focus in the room, if desired? Focus can most easily be directed with sound and lighting. If you have a lot going on, try using these elements to draw the visitor to a specific object or guide them in their interactions. Have I provided an intuitive experience for visitors? This is something that you can figure out during testing. Have I provided options for all visitors? This and the next question relate to accessibility. It's important that as designers and developers, we consider how users of varying ages, body types, and abilities will interact with our works. I often hear pushback to this in that people say, it's not the experience if we don't make it challenging, or we just can't make this experience accessible for so-and-so. And my pushback to that pushback would be that challenge looks different to different people. If you're having a hard time figuring out how to make your experience accessible, try to consider what the goal of that experience really is. Congratulations on completing this course. I know it's been a ton of information, and hopefully it's helped to demystify how to create interactive artworks and experiences from programming to installation. Of course, we couldn't cover everything, especially without additional equipment, but this course should at least get you started out towards making your own interactive artworks and installations. For homework and to test what you've learned, try to start or continue the process of developing a singular interactive artwork or a room scale exhibit. Try making a mood board, flowchart, and or interactivity matrix. Then try asking yourself some of the questions we established in this video to figure out how you can improve the design. If you've already started prototyping, see if you can do a material study or proof of concept and get a bit closer to realizing your idea. Feel free to share photos and videos on our course page. If you'd like a more hands-on and live deep dive into designing installations, feel free to drop by my office hour this Tuesday at 1 p.m. EDT, East Coast time, where we'll collaborate on creating a room scale exhibit via group design exercise. Thank you so much for all your hard work throughout the course. I can't wait to see what you create. Happy hacking.